Hey adapters, I'm Doug Parsons. I'm a partner at Simpatico Studios where we live stream conversations about complex business and social challenges with professionals like yourself who are working on the same issues. Our shows are live stream in front of a global audience of your professional peers on Simpatico.tv. I'm building a new type of online community for professionals like yourself on the Climate Adaptation Channel. If you're a regular listener of my America Adapts podcast, I think you'll find that we're taking our conversations about important problems, policies, and solutions to the next level here. And if you're interested in being a guest, we'd love to hear from you. And now join us for this latest episode. Hey adapters, welcome back. Today our guest is John Englander. John is an oceanographer and author whose work focuses on sea level rise and its impacts of increased flooding as it combines with severe storms and extreme tides. His current research and consulting have focused on how businesses, communities, and government agencies need to begin intelligent adaptation now to ensure a viable and sustainable future. John will talk about how rising sea levels may be the challenge of the century and the extreme efforts it will take to reduce global warming so that its impacts can be reduced somewhat. He stresses to plan and execute adaptation to global sea level rise now as it will be the economic engine of the future. Hey, John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Doug. All right, we're here. We're finally getting to talk. I know we've sort of interacted over, you know, different platforms, but not officially kind of had a, a great conversation. So I'm very excited to get you on. You are quite honestly, a legend in sea level rise circles. And so I'm glad to get you on Simpatico to share what you're doing. And so, you know, can we just, I guess, get a little bit of background of what you're doing? You know, how do you get into the sea level rise space? Sure. And it is great to meet. I've heard about your work as, as a journalist specializing in climate change for years. So this is really a pleasure for me, too. I, uh, I wrote my first book, High Tide on Main Street. It came out in 2012. Uh, but and most people would think that that's my, the beginning of my work on sea level. Um, it actually goes back 50 years. I was uh, a geology major in Pennsylvania, Dickinson College. And during the summers, I worked as a dive instructor in the Bahamas. And between my paleogeology class about ancient uh, geology and diving. So my beginnings go back to uh, actually 1970 when I was 200 feet underwater. And I noticed what was a strange little miniature beach in the very clear water of the Bahamas. And back in my geology class or paleogeology about ancient geology, I talked to my professor and he quickly indicated that that was probably when sea level was down at that level, 200 feet down below water during the recovery from the last ice age. And that started my interest in sea level and in thousands of dives, including under the polar ice cap and deep in submarines, I've got to do some pretty neat stuff. I always was kind of on the lookout for ancient sea levels. And then in um, uh, 97, I did some work with Jacques Cousteau, who many of your viewers would perhaps remember as kind of a pioneer of everything underwater. And then in Greenland in 2007, I got this idea that, wait a minute, as the world warms and the ice sheets got smaller, sea level would get taller and the shorelines would move inland. And that's a pretty simple story, but pretty dramatic. And that began my... Uh, teaching it, if you will, researching it and putting the case together and uh, and teaching the topic. But um, so I've, I've been in and out of sea level rise for many decades. Wow. Jacques Cousteau. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Uh, he's obviously a legend. And so the book itself, Going 2012, that doesn't seem like that long ago, but actually that's a lifetime ago when you think about how people have been talking about sea level rise and such. And, you know, I guess, why did you write that book, though? I mean, what, what kind of inspired you at that point that we needed a book on on it's been it got great response and it's obviously driven a lot of what you've done since then but why the book sure in um uh 1997 jacques and i spent three days together uh he hired me to become ceo of the Cousteau society and oh. we had a magical opportunity just pretty much one-on-one -on -one, although he was there to get an award and an event i chaired uh, in Florida, in, in Orlando, but we talked about the world. And here was Jacques Cousteau, as you say, you know, he was then 86 years old and a legend, literally and deservedly, and had seen the world change in a lot of ways, not just the oceans, and uh, got me thinking different. And I got out of the diving business, actually, because he hired me. And, and unfortunately, he died six months later. But it started my thinking of the world differently. And it was really, you know, 
being to some degree under his uh, mentorship, I guess. Um, and then 10 years later, I was in Greenland for the first time. And it suddenly all clicked that that sea level, because it determined the shoreline, as the ocean gets higher, the, well, the shoreline goes inland all over the world. And that gets real estate and that that should get everybody's interest. And I realized that I could tell a very simple story based upon good science, a little bit like Cousteau did and not, not nearly as good as him, but he took science and made it interesting and simple to understand. And I realized I had this clarity about, about sea level and climate change and the ice ages and all these different pieces that most people would not be able to put in context. And it occurred to me in my first night in Greenland in August, 2007, that I thought there was a way to tell its story to where climate would become understandable to people. And that began my journey. Okay, so let's talk maybe some fundamentals of sea level rise. Let's just kind of get that out there too. Uh, there's this sort of assumption that, you know, the seas are rising, but why? What, what's really happening out there? Well, over my head here, you can see Greenland, uh, which is the second biggest ice mass in the world. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's Antarctica down there behind me as well. And those two chunks of ice on land represent 200 feet, 212 feet of sea level rise if they were to all melt. And over millions of years, they get bigger and smaller by nature, frankly. Uh, it's what we think of as the ice age cycles. They've been happening very regularly every 100,000 years for 2.58 million years. We know that from geology. We don't see that because it's usually on a scale of moving up and down um, about 400 feet, 120 meters every 100,000 years. And that's not a time scale that humans can notice. And we were particularly fooled because sea level had been rising for 20,000 years, it does, and had was leveling off and would have begun the falling phase for 80,000 years of that ice age cycle. But now because we've warmed the planet beyond the normal boundaries, sea level is going up even higher. And so to get to answer that question, sea level by nature, as the ice sheets move in a natural cycle, moves up and down 400 feet, roughly 120 meters. We were stable for 4,000 years, five, five or 6,000 years, actually, all of human civilization, because we were at the natural turning point. But now we're going higher because the ice sheets are getting smaller. So I've seen some of those graphs and it, it, it is kind of hard to pull out like how fast, because that's one of the questions everybody has is like, well, how does the historic record tell us how fast can it and how fast has it done in the past? And sometimes you actually see like a step kind of like growth. It's almost directly up, but that still doesn't mean like overnight it rises that much. Right. But could you maybe give some examples of like where like how many feet you know, a decade or what some scales that are down, I guess, at the human scale. Sure. sure. 11,000 years ago, which seems like forever to a, our society. But, you know, if you think about the, uh, you know, Christian era is 2000 years and the Old Testament and Chinese calendar and Jewish calendars are 5000 years old. 11,000 years ago is not that long ago. And it's certainly in the archaeologic and anthropologic records. Well, 11,000 years ago, sea level rose over 15 feet in one century. Wow. And that's without human effect. So that gives us an idea of what can happen during the natural cycle. The rate now is increasing decade by decade, and some think it's going to go exponential. We don't know how quickly it'll get, but it could get, again, on the order of 10 feet in a century. We don't know that. Right now, it's happening still at about a quarter of an inch a year, but it's the rate of increase that's got us concerned, the acceleration rate, the doubling time, which is getting shorter. Okay, so we're not quite sure exactly how much it's gonna rise, let's say in a century, but at this stage with the warming that's already baked in, is sea level rise unstoppable for the foreseeable future? Yeah, and it, 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 that surprises most people, but I'm glad you asked the question that way. Even if we, eliminated greenhouse gas emissions, the carbon dioxide that everybody tracks and methane and so on and nitrous oxide, even if we could zero out greenhouse gas emissions, sea level will rise for centuries because we've warmed the oceans one degree Celsius. That's 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So rounded off to two degrees. So if the oceans are one degree Celsius, almost two degrees Fahrenheit warmer, there's gonna be less ice in Greenland and Antarctica 
and sea level will rise. And that is now in a, in a mode that's unstoppable. We can slow it a bit and we should try, but we need to begin adaptation. What I think, in the, this is all part of the natural cycle, but some of the, well, I think the majority of the sea level rise that we've seen is just warming, right? And it kind of gives that false sense of how fast it could happen. Is that accurate though? Like in the last 30, 40 years, is the warming been most of it? And the pulse that's going to come from frozen ice that's melting, is that's what we can expect coming forward? Great question. You, you obviously know a lot about this. So thermal expansion of seawater is what we talk about, the warming as you describe it. And about in, in the last century, we've had roughly 10 inches, 20 centimeters of sea level rise. Okay. Almost half of it's come from just the warming of the water, the expansion of seawater. So a little more than half's come from the melting of the ice sheets. But that's going to change this century because uh, the way the warming is happening and what's happening in Greenland and Antarctica that we actually see and can observe and, and measure now, uh, you can see the acceleration. So we know for certain that while thermal expansion will continue, that the melting ice on land and glaciers will take over as the dominant effect this century. All right. So what places are going to be most affected? If you think about what you know about sea level rise over the next, and you know what, I want to break this apart because this too is, I think, a policy and management decision. What, what areas are most likely to be affected in the next 30 to 50 years? But then, you know, we always hear 2100, which is still a ways away. Like, could you kind of map out the, the impacts there? Sure. So let's think of global sea level change and say that it's increasing and whether we get to one meter or three meters this century, depending on what we do with slowing the warming and the greenhouse gases and the you know energy production, which is a separate aspect. But depending on how good we are at slowing the warming, let's say we're gonna get between one and three meters, between three and 10 feet this century, and it's with an acceleration built, built in there. Um, in terms of where are we gonna see it first to your question? Well, obviously we're gonna see it in the lowest areas, whether that be South Florida, the Florida Keys and Miami, but all over the world from South Carolina to Alabama, New Orleans, to Bangladesh, Vietnam, Copenhagen, I, we could go around the world. Uh, there are low lying coastal areas all over the world and some with tens of millions of people as some of the places I just named. The, um, the places it's worse most it's most observed right now is where the land is sinking or subsiding. And the prime examples of that is Jakarta, where they've had over 10 feet, three meters of sea level rise in the last 25 years because the land is sinking. Wow. Similar to New Orleans, Virginia Beach, Norfolk in, in the US, uh, Venice, Italy is famous. People have all seen the those images of how they're putting platforms out in St. Mark's Square in Venice that didn't used to happen because Venice is sinking. So there's global sea level rise. There's places where just geologically the land is sinking for one of several reasons, like New Orleans, Jakarta, Venice, uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And um, I, so that's the combination. There's regional places where it's sinking more, but where will you, where will the effects of a few feet or half a meter of sea level show up most? And that's going to be the low, the lowest, uh, you know, land areas. So the, the, it's the combination of the sinking land and then where is the, the profile of the land contour. Like in California, most of the land is up on a bluff. There's not that much land right down at sea level like there is in the southeastern United States, but going right up through New England and the Cranberry Bogs or the marshlands of New Jersey, those are all very low lying areas like the Florida Everglades. But um, so you have to look at elevation and then where the land is sinking to see the most vulnerable. Okay, so you'd mentioned one meter, you've mentioned three meters. Why is there such a variation in then these projections? We know we've warmed the oceans. The oceans store a tremendous amount of heat that's been trapped in the atmosphere by the greenhouse gases. The reason we don't know exactly how quickly sea level rise is that piece of ice up there, whoops, I guess it's there, Greenland, over my finger, um, is as big as the Eastern United States. It's covered by over a mile or a couple of kilometers of ice. Antarctica is seven times bigger. Those two giant ice sheets, we know they're melting, but it's like predicting the next mudslide or earthquake. You can't entirely predict over the next 80 years how those massive ice sheets are gonna collapse and melt. And that's 
why we don't know exactly how quickly sea level rise because that's the dominant driver. And that's partly driven by what we do with our energy policy. We couldn't possibly tell you how warm the planet will be in the next 80 years because we don't know whether we're going to use all, burn all the coal, whether we're going to use nuclear, whether we're going to be able to make all of our energy needs from renewables, geothermal, solar, and wind. So with those variables, the best we can get right now is between one to three meters and so three to 10 feet, but more in the next century actually. So it's it's not a firm deadline there of the year 2100. We, we need, while that's used in climate talks to say what will happen by 2100, as you said, it's gonna get worse in the next century. So the adaptation to sea rise is an investment in the future. Okay, so nice pivot to adaptation. That was my next question. Just, you know, how is, you know, how are different countries and I guess com different communities uh, adapting to sea level rise at the moment? And I want to add to that question, just as you described, obviously we can't predict the future as well as we'd like to, but as you can imagine, and you know, you're a consultant and you have you talked to people, imagine these poor communities when you're saying it could be one meter, it could be three meter. You just like, I could see where a mayor is saying, what, what are you doing to me here? How could I possibly plan it? in that kind of spectrum. And so I guess, how are we doing out there? And then, you know, dealing with that uncertainty. Great question. So uh, places that are doing the best, I mean, the Netherlands has been dealing with trying to recover land from the sea and, and, and protect themselves ever since uh, the storm 60 years ago when 1800 people died one night when a levee broke. And they've got some really neat um, mechanisms and engineering to do that. But even they are really challenged with this new rate of sea level rise. Countries like Singapore are now planning on four meters of sea level rise as wow. their design criteria, way ahead of us. Uh, Miami is looking at it, Boston's looking at it, New York, San Francisco, but we're kind of taking baby steps because we really don't know and it's so disruptive to plan for th more than three feet of sea level rise. So we're all experimenting with that, I think. Different countries, I was in the UK recently in London, uh, the Thames River has some issues right up there in London. Um, you know, Washington DC is on a tidal river. So there's vulnerability of sea level rise, not just on the ocean, wherever there's tidal river flow, uh, tidal water change. Um, in terms of the uncertainty and what should either officials or business people or just homeowners do? Well, the good news about sea level rise is that it can happen overnight. You just can't melt that much ice in the next 10 years. So sea level rise is not going to be the big driver of dramatic change. More storms, heavier rainfall, downhill runoff, coming at an extreme high tide. If all of those things happen together, we're going to get a lot of flooding. But that could happen next week. And But the water will recede. Sea level is the opposite. It can not happen quick and sudden, but it's permanent effectively. When sea level rises like a drip filling the bucket, it's not going to go down for centuries. So it has an entirely opposite characterization of the flooding we worry about. The good news is if we can get educated and explain people through programs like this, what's happening and tell the truth and make the science really understandable, not get rid of the jargon, we can design a world that a hundred years from now can function when sea level is 10 feet higher. And I like to say, you know, you don't plan for a medium hurricane. You don't plan for a medium uh, disaster of any kind. We plan for extreme events. Well, with sea level, it's different. We know that sea level has to get higher. It's happened in history. The last time sea level was higher was 122,000 years ago. It got 25 feet higher. That's without human intervention. So if we have that clarity and, the new, and now we do about the Earth's history, we can start planning and investing and building for a world a century from now, just as people did in ancient times, building cathedrals that they couldn't finish in their lifetimes. They were, they were doing, they were digging wells and planting vineyards and olive groves that, you know, that, that future generations would enjoy. We should be thinking that way about coastal society because humans have never experienced sea level higher than today. And yet it's inevitable. The world's warmer. There's going to be less ice. There's going to be higher sea level. Well, I've had this conversation before about Miami and you're just right there at the, around the, the neck of the woods. And I think Miami to its credit has done a lot of very, you know, aggressive and, you know, planning, but at the end of the day, 
if you're talking six, seven, eight feet of sea level rise, I mean, I grew up in Florida, that limestone geology, it's, you're not building a seawall. So like New York City, I think they're gonna spend the money, they're gonna put a seawall, and I'm, who knows if it'd be completely successful, but you just can't necessarily do that. The water will come around through the Everglades or whatever. So how does a city like Miami responsibly plan for sea level rise? Because you just can't put everything on stilts and you know, the whole notion of managed retreat comes into the equation, but then no mayor is gonna ever run on that issue. Right. And so we have to, this is brand new. We've never had something in human history. I mean, we, we may have feared nuclear attack, but that was a what if. We know sea level is going to get higher. Again, we now know enough to know that it was 25 feet higher. So I don't expect the current mayor to make the plans to cope with 10 feet of sea level rise. But I do think any coastal community can begin thinking short, medium, and long-term planning and anticipating kind of a worst case scenario three or four generations from now, so that their planning builds a foundation for something that will be a viable community five generations from now. That, in other words, Miami may put in pumps and raise some seawalls right now, but I think there is a design for Miami, it will be pretty radical, when sea level is five feet higher. And the truth is, the sea is going to rise whether we plan for it or not. It's just that we've never in human civilization experienced sea level higher than today. We know it existed 122,000 years ago. We know how high it was. We're heading back there. We can either ignore it and wish it wouldn't happen or say, I can't cope with this. Or we can say, this is what I can do this decade. This is what I can do by mid-century. Raise the building codes, et cetera. And we can begin to design futuristic cities, maybe floating cities, Maybe sitting's up on, you know, large platforms. Maybe we're just migrating inland over the next century. But, um, you know, it's kind of like aging, I like to say. It, it's, we don't like to think about aging. and We don't know whether we're going to live for three weeks or 30 years or, or whatever. But we do make contingency plans. But we realize where, where aging is heading. We're going to be in a wheelchair probably at some point in our life. And so we, we may not want to get into a, you know, out of a, into a house where there's no stairs. So that's got like planning for the future. Well, that's well, interesting. Right. We, we've, got to, we've got to plan for the future. And the truth is, if we think of it as that short, medium, and long-term planning, just as we do for our own lives and our families, it becomes a lot easier. And it's interesting, you mentioned, like, there's things that we can do now, but you're saying mayors in the future of Miami will also sort of be grappling with this. But if you look around Miami, there are a lot of cranes and a lot of development in every new house that's built the old way further constrains the hands of those future mayors, you know? And so they're, Miami's got us a reckoning, I think, that based on it, even the encouragement of development, they, and it's not just Miami, all of Florida. I'm from Florida. Thank you. That's <laughs> what I was going to say next is, you know, we pick on Miami right. as if it's the, the place, okay? The truth is, what about Tampa? What about Fort Lauderdale next up the coast? What Sarasota, about Mac my you know, hometown? What, you know, what, uh, we could go all, uh, Charleston, Savannah, Annapolis, Baltimore, you know, I mean, this is every coastal community, and we I think, I think picking on Miami as if it's the place with the problem is misleading because it lets every place else off the hook and just acts like it's a Miami problem. There's 10,000 coastal communities that are vulnerable to sea level rise. I mean, whether you go to the UK or whether you go to Singapore or Hong Kong, um, every place needs to think of this. Miami's beautiful. My wife likes going there to go salsa dance, so I, sh I shouldn't pick on Miami too much. Um, we're almost done here. I just have a, you know, a, another question for you, but just in the, the community room, Sarah shared a, a, a map of, from Climate Central. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you can look up your city and what's projected. You know, there's all these sort of ge yeah. map generators and Climate Central has a good one. And so people have been doing it. And uh, Tashnia looked at Bangladesh and over 90% of Bangladesh seems to be submerged by 2050, I guess, in the cinema model that she looked at. So yeah, th these are these tools out there, but hopefully it'll wake some people up. Absolutely. Okay. So last question, and this is, you've got a book coming out and it's obviously sea level rise related. Can you give us a, a, a sneak peek of, there we go. All right. Let me get a little more close up on that. Um, wh what's the book about? When's it supposed to come out? Uh, it'll be out April 6th in uh, print, ebook, and uh, audiobook. Moving to Higher Ground, Rising Seas and the Path Forward. It's, uh, it's definitely the, the, 
the updated version of my last book, but goes much further beyond that and talks more about the adaptation and the psychology and puts it in the frame of uh, architects and engineers and mayors. How do we need to think about this? All right. So I think you could probably write a book every five years because as you as you follow this issue, things are changing so fast and there's all sorts of new recommendations. And so I think there's going to be demand for even though I don't know if you're up for writing a book every five years, it's just <laughs> there's going to be a demand for this. But John, it's it's amazing what you've been doing. You've been a, a leading voice on this issue and it sounds like you will continue to be a leading voice. And I, I appreciate you coming on Simpatico and sharing your message. Well, Doug, the same here. I, I really appreciate what you and Sympatico are doing and getting the word out, amplifying my voice or giving it a, a, a vehicle to get out to the public. And it, that's what's really important. So we're, we're in this together. We're on the same team. And uh, I hope to do this again with you. Excellent. All right. So I want to take you into just chatting, but let's just close out this episode. But uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> 